as the title says, my goal is to be, my goal will be to give kind of a slightly funny description of how you get, how you arrive at the category of matrix activations, and then to kind of give an application of that to understanding their Hochschild invariance in a slightly pretty way. So here's the pre-starting point. This is gonna be kind of a motivation for the way we're gonna think about more complicated things in a little bit. So let's start with vector space or chain complex V. So here are two types of extra structure that we could try to give to this vector space. One is we could try to put it over the punctured affine line, put it over GM, make it KXX inverse linear. And the other, so that just corresponds to an invertible endomorphism. The other is we could let Z act on V, and that also corresponds to an invertible endomorphism. And you know, there's all, this is a discrete version because Z is discrete. There's also an infinitesimal variant where we replace Z by the trivial Lie algebra in rank one. And so you know, putting something over the line is the same as making this trivial Lie algebra, or better yet, its formal group, GA hat, act on the complex. And an interesting observation, which is why I like to call it a duality, is that, that these two GAs are linearly dual. They're dual lines. So for instance, this is actually phenom uh, this phenomenon, this description is actually familiar to some people in a much more complicated context where you have this description, for instance, if you think about Higgs bundles or Higgs sheaves as, on the one hand, they're linear over functions on the cotangent bundle, but there's also this other description, this nonlinear description, as things acted on by the tangent group. Excuse me, uh, yeah, okay. But okay, so this is some sort of duality, and what I'm gonna do now is describe how matrix factorizations can be regarded as kind of a categorification of this construction. So starting point, actual starting point. So what's matrix factorizations all about? What are we trying to do? This is the landau ginzburg B model, or in other words, non-commutative singularity theory, okay? So what's this non-commutative mumbo jumbo? So classically, you know, if you're interested in a smooth variety, the non-commutative viewpoint is to attach to it some category, and more precisely some, you know, K linear, idempotent complete, nice DG category. But, you know, for a smooth variety, it's just perfect complexes. So in order to do singularity theory of a map from a variety to A1 in this setting, you have to first kind of convince yourself that there's a good analog of a map from a smooth variety to A1 in this non-commutative setting. And well, so here, to kind of answer the question of what is that, we have this observation of Konstantin Telemann. So if we have a category C, in particular this one, perfect complexes on M, making it linear over KXX inverse, there's a space of ways of doing this, and you can compute that space, it's discrete, and it turns out to be just identified with the you know, invertible global functions on M, the map to GM. And then you do another computation, and you see that giving one of these things, the same as giving this very categorical data of an action of the circle viewed as BZ, like it's just a homotopy type on C. And so it just to kind of spell out a tiny bit what, how to think about this. So roughly giving an action of BZ on a category, it's in particular giving an action of Z giving you like an action of Z on each object. So an action, like a map from Z to each endomorphism algebra. And then they have to satisfy some coherences, you know, has to be compatible with a, a composition in some way. But roughly, you can think of this as giving an automorphism of every object of the category. All right, so we got our smooth variety. We have a category associated to it. And to an invertible function, we got a circle action. And now, how do I get to matrix factorization? So the first step is, let's take the fiber, or if the function is bad, the derived fiber, but ignore that. Let's take the fiber of the variety over one. And then you can ask, given a group acting on something, you can take invariance and co-invariance. So for instance, if, and if that group is like the circle, when you do that, the thing you get, if there's some sort of linearity involved, will be linear over co-chains on BS1, on CP infinity, which is ad, as an algebra is this thing. K join beta, beta in degree minus two. So let's talk a little bit about this invariance side, okay? So roughly, in terms of what I was saying before, if I was thinking of BZ acting on a category as for every object X in my category, I have you know, a map from Z into the endomorphisms of X, in this case, you know, it's n goes to f to the n. So lifting it to invariance is gonna be roughly equivalent, and in this case, literally equivalent, to giving a trivialization of this action. So in other words, a homotopy, you could, or a trivialization between f and one. And that's pretty much the same thing as lifting a perfect complex on m to a coherent complex on m one. 
So that's actually a plausible looking statement. And you know, this gives you all sorts of other things. Like if you have the inclusion from the invariant category to C and two objects, you can ask how do you compute the mapping space here? Well, you compute the mapping space between the images, and these trivializations kind of mean that that mapping space will itself have an action of the circle, and you take invariant. And if you trace through, that works out to a certain very standard resolution, like the, what's called the bar resolution, for computing HOMs in the category of modules on a fiber in terms of HOMs of the push forward. This defunctor from invariance to, to complexes here is push forward along the inclusion. All right, so you know this is kind of an abstract nonsense instruction, but in this case, if one traces through, you can make sense of that pretty concretely. So if I have a category that's linear over k join beta, there's another con there's a construction I can do. I can invert beta, and in the case of the circle, kind of this composite construction. Uh, sorry, that's supposed to be a definition of C Tate as C S one tensor blah blah blah. This is called the Tate construction. It's kind of like the quotient of the invariance by the co-invariance. And in this case, it's literally the quotient of the invariance by the co-invariance, the category of singularities. So from this circle action on the category, performing purely algebraic constructions, we've gotten a two-periodic DG category. So linear over that is the same as two-periodic or Z mod two graded. And in this case, as it's well known, that this has a certain explicit model in terms of matrix factorization. So these are two-periodic complexes with maps back and forth, factorizing F. So this we finally made contact with this point in the title, okay? And so you can ask after I've done all this, great, I just recovered a definition that we already had, what in the world can this possibly be good for? And that's a very legitimate question. So to answer that question, I'm gonna, yeah. No, not necessarily. Right, so this definition has to be severely modified in the non-affine case, but the point is there does exist a definition. Like for instance, you can take this very large, like the Positowski definition and n k compact objects. But you know, that is something involved that is visibly too periodic, and that relates to this structure. And I guess I should say, if I started with a non-smooth thing and coherent complexes, for instance, you also get something too periodic and well-defined, and that's like Positowski's relative category of singularities. Okay? So kind of the goal of this talk is to relate this very categorical stuff, the non-commutative singularity theory, to kind of more classical, less categorical objects. So for instance, in previous days of talk, we've heard about you know, the Frobenius algebra associated to a singularity, at least to a nice singularity. And you, know, you might want to ask, are there some linear invariants of this category which are like that? Well, of course, there's a standard construction from a DG category to various linear algebraic data, namely taking these things called Hochschild invariants and Hochschild invariants. So Hochschild cohomology, Hochschild homology, and just to clarify this notation, the bullet means I'm not actually taking homology or cohomology. This is, for instance, some model of the complexes. But yeah, so our linear complexes, in this case, two periodic complexes. And well, one good thing about these complexes is that they're functorally attached. So if I have a group acting on a category, the group will act on the associated complexes, and there are certain natural comparison maps so you get the circle action and get you get natural comparison maps from the Hochschild and let's say cohomology of the Tate constructions, so that's matrix factorizations here, with its two periodic structure, to you know, the analogous construction at the level of chain complexes. And there's kind of just as a little cheat, these explicit these constructions at the level of chain complexes have explicit models. So if I have a complex Z, a circle action on it is the same as a B operator. So that's a map from Z to V shifted by one, satisfying a certain you know, D squared equals zero condition. And in that case, for instance, V Tate is explicitly given by, you take B, Z, you adjoin beta, or you adjoin kind of a, well, a Laurent variable beta, it's the same one, it's also in homological degree minus two, and then you take the differential to be the internal differential of V plus beta times this B operator. And of course, if you kind of do matrix factorization things, you know that formulas like this come up all the time. Or if you do, so good to have things like that. So here we come to the least formal part of this talk. This is kind of the thing that is not just pure category theory, but it involves actually a little bit of geometry. So there's a theorem due to Kevin Lin, uh, Dan Permigliano, and independently myself, that at least, you know, if you make the simplifying assumption that one is the only critical point of your function F, then these maps are equivalencies. 
So in other words, you can understand at least what I say here is the underlying complex of the category of matrix factorizations in terms of some algebraic construction. Of course, in order to actually get a handle on it, you have to understand this B operator in this case, and we'll come back to that. All right, so one problem with what I said just now is of complexes, right? If I mentioned the words like Frobenius manifold earlier, and that involves all sorts of multiplicative and extra structure on a complex. And so a wonderful thing is, of course, that the Hochschild invariants have all sorts of rich extra structure. So under reasonable hypotheses, for instance, you can feed them into, machi into the machine that Dan Freed was talking about uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday or two days ago, whenever. And you, for instance, get that the Hochschild homology and cohomology are the values assigned to a circle in some theory. And you know, in particular, that means that you can do that sort of generalized pair of pants product that he was describing. You know, here's my flattened pair of pants. And you get an algebra structure on this Hochschild complex. But it's not just an algebra structure. As he was saying, it's what's called an E2 algebra structure. It's exactly the thing that's encoded by you know, all of these diagrams as I move the circles, allow them to glue into each other. But it's one of these things. And there's a certain other structure on the Hochschild homology complex which is kind of familiar to people who work in this stuff. It's a framed E2 module over the E2 algebra. So that the little f is basically denoting the fact that we're going to, at some point, remember a circle action corresponding to the Durham differential. So because these are also functorially attached, what you get are circle actions on these gadgets with all of this extra structure. So in particular, that means I can lift this guy to an S1 equivariant E2 algebra, et cetera, et cetera. These natural maps automatically upgrade. And this theorem automatically upgrades because you know, being an equivalence is a property once you have the, a map. All right, so that's great. Now, as I was saying here, we want to actually compute this B operator, not just at the level of complexes, but you know, giving a B operator on an E2 algebra is potentially much more complicated. You have to kind of give a lot of data to get an S1 equivariant E2 algebra. And so the goal now is going to be to figure out how to compute this. So here we run into the complication, right? So E2 algebras, the way I describe them over here, are completely non-combinatorial gadgets. So it's difficult to say what it means to compute one, right? There are not that many examples of these that you can write down, like a priori, to even compare to. This is already an issue of trying to write down the E2 structure on like Hochschild invariants of perfect complexes, OK? Well, and like for instance, the notion of formality doesn't actually make sense a priori because when you take the homology of an E2 algebra, you don't get a homo you don't get an E2 algebra, you get something else, and the thing that you get is a Gerstenhaber algebra. So this is something that is very combinatorial. It's just a nice mixing of a commutative algebra and a degree one Lie bracket. So it turns out that there's after making a certain universal auxiliary choice, there's a second way of going from E2 algebras to just purely combinatorial gadgets, or at least you know, the slightly more complicated homotopy invariant version, homotopy Gerstenhaber, which th this DQ stands for dequantization. It's like adding up, tazdan, dequantization to people who like those words. So this gives you a construction which has the nice property that at least you know, over in its characteristic field, this is where we've been this whole time, it's invertible. E2 algebras are the same via this universal choice that we had to make once to homotopy Gerstenhaber algebras. And so now I have a more concrete goal about what com compute means, right? It means I compute something that has you know, a commutative product, a Lie bracket, and a bunch of infinite correction terms, but that are kind of explicitly listed or listable at least. OK, so now that I've kind of framed the problem, the goal for the rest of the talk is going to be to make sense of this theorem, which is kind of actually an easy theorem, and this is kind of an imprecise formulation here. Namely that this equivariant, S1 equivariant E2 algebra, and you know, the full package with it, its module, all that. First, it depends only on the E2 algebra, oh, so this notation is bad, I'm sorry. So that E2 algebra depends only on the Hochschild invariance of perfect complexes as an E2 algebra, together with a little bit of extra data, encoding the, super, including, encoding the superpotential. In particular, it doesn't actually depend on the category C, except for the category C of perfect complexes. It doesn't depend on that, except for through this E2 algebra. And it has an ex and like the way in which it does not depend has an explicit description as what's called an adjoint, an E2 adjoint action. And I'll say what that is in a second. 
and the reason this is good is, so thanks to work of several people, who I'll mention, Joel Gashef, well, Tamark and Tegan, the like homotopy Gerstenhauer structure on Hochschild invariant of perfect complexes, you can give an explicit model for. It's given by the naive Gerstenhauer structure you would think it is, it's formal. So since the answer to the thing I want depends only on that structure, and I have this wonderful formality theorem for that structure, I can leverage it once, you once I understand you know, this part two, this description well enough, I can leverage it to give kind of a nice explicit description that agrees with kind of our expectations. And I'll say what those expectations are later. All right, so moving on. So first, it will be convenient to work for li with Lie algebras. And so remember on that first slide, I had the discrete version involving Z and then also an infinitesimal version involving BJ or GA hat. So there's the same thing here. The I issue is now BZ is replaced by BJ hat, which is a derived formal group. And to make sense of this, you know, it's not necessarily trivial to make sense of a notion like that. And so the great thing is this notion is very robust, it turns out. So this is a theorem slash definition with roughly four or eight parts, depending how you count it. And you get to pick, like, so the bottom one's actually legitimately different from the rest, but the top three all equally well deserve to be called a BGA hat action. And you can pick any one of these to be f comfortable with, and you'll get a reasonable definition and a reasonable theory. So roughly, you can think of it as a Lie algebra action, a DG Lie algebra action of K shifted by one on the category. And you know that isn't the defined notion a priori. But you can define it as a map of Lie algebras from k shifted by 1 to the shifted Hochschild complex. There's kind of a very abstract definition that I won't say anything about other than if you like functors on Artin rings, the naive definition makes sense and works. Then there's the kind of approach that's closest to the classical one, Dewey Kuntsevich and all that, which is as a curved k adjoined beta linear deformation of your category. And these form a space by, say, looking at the Maro Cartan and uh, Khan complex. And finally, there's the claim that this is equivalent to, in general, maps of E2 algebras from K adjoin X to Hochschild cohomology. So, for instance, that thing here, the reason it's so simple is just because this Hochschild cohomology in that case lives in negative degrees and maps from uh, homologically negative degrees, cohomologically positive, and maps of E2 algebras in that case are just the same as maps of discrete things and then I'm just picking out an element. So, in fact, these two are always equivalent. It's just this one that was the special simple thing in the case of interest. So, what was this E2 adjoint action I was trying to talk about earlier? So what do we really want to understand? If you translate it into this funny formal moduli problem, th description, we have B squared GA hat. It maps to kind of the completion of the big space of BG categories at our category. That is encoding this action of BGA hat. Then to a DG category, I can associate an E2 algebra and to that a Lie algebra. And so for instance, if I want to understand the action of BGA hat on the Lie algebra underlying Hochschild cochain shifted by one, I want to understand this composite map. If I want to understand the action of the Lie algebra, or sorry, of the formal group on the E2 algebra of Hochschild cochains, I want to understand this composite map. And the first observation is, this is the only place that depended on our superpotential. So I can split up this question into two halves. And uh, so the first bit at the level of tangent DG Lie algebras is just a map like that. And if you recall what our Hochschild complex looks like, this is pretty obvious what it is in that case. Yeah. So uh, in this case, yeah, no, so I mean, so all I'm referring to, yeah, that's right, that's a, that's a great point. No, I'm referring to something far simpler. In my case, I'm just interested in, I have a smooth variety and I have a map, which I'm calling the superpotential, from it to A1. This is like the, the easy finite dimensional case, right? This is the input deforming the category, like the category of matrix factorizations viewed as, well, it's, yeah. Right? And that's what W is there, and yeah. And so then there's this second bit. And at the level of DG Lie algebras, 
It's a map from the Hochschild complex shifted by one that controls deformations of our category, roughly. Two, the space of E2 derivations of the Hochschild complex, which is something you can actually get a handle on if you need to. And you know, if I wanted to understand the Lie guy, it would be to the space of Lie derivations. And so there's a claim here that depends only on the E2 algebra. So by rather than saying that claim, let me explain what these things actually are. I said they're the Lie adjoint action, which should be a familiar thing, and the E2 adjoint action, which should be a less familiar thing. So Lie adjoint action. So we know if we have a Lie algebra, it acts it's on itself, so it's a module over itself. But it turns out that the Lie bracket is also compatible with that. So you have a natural lift of any Lie algebra to a Lie algebra in Lie modules over itself. For an associative algebra, that's false. An associative algebra is a module over itself, but it's not an algebra in modules over itself. But you can fix that by passing to its underlying Lie algebra, you know, by a commutator, and then it works again. So it turns out that this second thing generalizes to En algebras for all n. So first, there's ob observation that if you start with a Lie algebra, uh, sorry, with an E2 algebra, let's say, this is n equals 2, then you shift it by n minus 1, so here by 1, and you get a Lie algebra. The claim is, which for instance you can see in some models in, with the proof of formulas and conceptually in other models, that it lifts to kind of an adjoint action algebra. Not only can you make A into a Lie module over A shifted by 1, which is, you know, at, at the level of underlying things, just the adjoint action for Lie algebras, you can then make it into an E2 algebra in these things. And there's also analogous explicit constructions of these, th of these types for Gerstenhaber algebras, where you just write down the naive formula and check that the Lie bracket is compatible with other structure. For homotopy Gerstenhaber algebras with some more work, and you can check that these operations for E2 algebras versus this and that are compatible in a certain precise sense under the operations of taking homology groups and of this funny dequantization function. So now we can leverage the formality result of Golishev, Figgin, and Tamarkin, which says that, you know, as a homotopy Gerstenhaber algebra, this input that we had is the same as just poly, like poly vector fields with its Schutten bracket, wedge, and all that good stuff. And what that tells you when you trace through is that as, you know, I guess the easiest way to say it is the B operator, as an E2 algebra, or I get more precisely as a homotopy Gerstenhaber algebra, on this thing that encodes the circle action on, the ho on this Hochschild complex is just given by the Lie bracket with W, which is, you know, on the Gerstenhaber gadget contraction with DW. And when you plug that into this formula I was writing here, you get a description of this type. That as a homotopy Gerstenhaber algebra, there exists a quasi-isomorphism between the Hochschild cohomology two periodic of matrix factorizations and kind of the, the explicit model that you would expect. Namely, you give kind of a, you give this funny two periodic version of poly vector fields, the differential given by contracting with GW, and then the product and all the uh, and the bracket and all that are induced from the standard structures that we know and love that p we know preserve this operation. All right, that's it. Yes, 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 uh -huh. I understand. Okay. But 
point is this, did, this was all universally dependent only on HHC, not on the super potential. So I can't vary it. I mean, you can change, you can change <coughs> M to something else. 